Hi, my name is Jessica Arnella, and I'm the past president of, of ISPS US, and it's my honor to introduce the family panel this afternoon, uh, consisting of Pat Wright and Cindy Marty Hodge. Um, I want to introduce uh, first uh, Cindy Marty, uh, an international peer sport trainer who, after years of struggling with hearing voices, is healing while supporting others to do the same. Cindy is a parent and a trainer for the Hearing Voices Movement. Uh, and, and Pat is a parent, educator, and advocate for families, especially those experiencing psychoses. Her qualifications being friend, sister, daughter, mom, and spouse uh, of those who experience extreme states as well as herself. And I just wanted to say personally that I've met these two folks, uh, you know, over the last few years and they've just contributed so much. And it's been such a pleasure to um, watch and grow alongside of them from telling their stories and in a way trying to get healing from themselves to now being these incredible advocates who are just really traveling around the world and around the country, lifting up others and sharing their experiences. Uh, and I've just been so moved and it's, it's really opened up my mind a lot as a clinician into how I work with, uh, with families and understanding that more. And I think, you know, today, especially talking about, you know, we've often ha sometimes held like people's lived experience and family members in some sort of opposition when that should not be the case. Um, and often these are one and the same people. And I think that might be some of what we talk about here today, um, with the, especially with this focus on the hearing voices movement. So I'm really excited to hear what you all have to say. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to the speakers for today. Thanks, Pat and Cindy Marty. Thanks, Jessica. What a nice uh, introduction and welcome. <clears throat> I'm still recovering from the award ceremony this morning. I'm, I was just overcome with um, so much appreciation for the kind words that, um, that were spoken. In the family panel, we seek to highlight a family perspective. I feel grateful to be sharing this hour with Cindy Marty from, as Jessica mentioned, Western Mass RLC. The format will be first me giving some of my background as a family member, then Cindy Marty will tell us about a new initiative under the Hearing Voices Network umbrella for friends and family of those who experience visions, hear voices, or have unusual beliefs. After Cindy, I'll share some personal ex examples of what I've learned using some of the principles Cindy has shared with us. We'll leave the last 15 minutes for any comments or questions you may have. So my background. When I first started meeting other parents of young adults diagnosed with psychosis, and I wish we had a different word for that. Um, it's what he was diagnosed. And I just want to mention that that's a medical framework and not a framework that I'm comfortable with, but for the purposes of... Um, discussion, we're going to just um, call it that for now. I just felt so different. Um, I'd spent over 15 years in the medical system myself. And uh, previous to his first hospitalization in 2009. So I was already uncomfortable with medical terms and didn't want to be called a patient and um, didn't want to be isolated, like we're only talking about, you know, your eyes today, or we're only talking about your leg today, we're only talking about your digestive tract today. And I really bristled that I didn't want to be chopped up and seen as these different parts to people. I noticed my filters were looking at illness through a social disability model versus the medical model. I had a network of kind, open-minded medical professionals I felt comfortable with and had literally trusted with my life because I had almost lost it a couple times. They supported my belief that I had a healer within me versus them knowing what, they, uh, what was best for me. And I got rid of those doctors really quickly because I knew I wouldn't be able to work with them. Um, the challenge for me was to find my tribe who could teach me how to balance self-care as well as be supportive of my son in the person-centered way I'd learned in all my disability policy and advocacy work over the years. What I did know 
and by the way, I'm still learning. It's not like I'm done with this. It's um, a continual process. It's very humbling. What I knew I did not want was my son to be continuously hospitalized like my younger sister, who, as I was growing up, was um, hospitalized uh, multiple times, accompanied by an assortment of um, diagnoses and prescriptions. We can't know another's experience, but it seemed she was living in her own private hell a lot of the time. I had also been humbled by the experience of going to the hospital to visit my dad when I was 21 and working at his small business. I wanted to talk to the psychiatrist about what why my dad couldn't remember anything I told him the day before. The psychiatrist mentioned that shock treatments will cause memory loss. Oh, I thought that was scary. I had no idea. Um, so that was my first experience with um, psychiatry and um, I was confused and frustrated to say the least. Needless to say, I had a lot of fear the day in the chemical dependency assessment office when told my son was in a psychotic episode and would be transferred up to the psych ward as soon as possible. I felt like the rug was taken out from under me. Thank goodness I'd just been voted in to be a national disability advocate with the National Participant Network out of Boston College. I can see now how validating it was to be among my peers discussing the fight for better services for those disabled. I found my mentors and knew I had a lot to learn. Initiation into the mental health system as a parent felt brutal on many levels, including my own self-doubts. I learned fairly quickly that partnering with a professional as part of Gabe's team would be very beneficial since he seemed engulfed in the, um, in the system, much to my dismay. Fortunately, he was assigned to Martha as his case manager early on um, on his ACT team, and we both grew to trust her as she had a rare gift of being able to hear him, empathize with me, and brainstorm options in times of extreme states. I also found ISPS, which has been a validating place to meet like-minded folks with diverse perspectives of a, the professional, the family member, and the person with lived experience. And just like Chaku yesterday was talking about um, the power of a supportive family, uh, it reminded me of one time my son was in the hospital and he had a, a psychiatrist from India. And at the time, uh, the hospital staff were really wanting to limit my um, taking him home for visits and out in the community and whatnot. And uh, the doctor from India was telling me a completely different thing that made much more sense to me. He said, oh no, it's really good that he can spend as much time with you as possible because that will bring him healing. So I was able to go in and just sign him in and sign him out. And I thought, wow, you know, the, the power of the psychiatrist that you happen to end up with. I was really grateful. And um, he had also told me that in India, people end up going to the hospital with their whole family. So it's not like, you know, hand your loved one over to us and we're going to fix them. It's the family saying, oh, we are going to heal together and advocate for each other. The friends I've met here and all I've learned has kept me involved in service, especially with family members. I was approached at a conference several years ago to help expand the family network within ISBS, and it's been with that goal that our next speaker, Cindy Marty, will be sharing on the friends and family um, voice hearers movement. I first met Cindy Marty in 2013 at a um, alternatives conference in Texas, and I was an instant fan. Um, I feel like I've been privileged to um, hear several times, uh, not only Cindy Marty, but other people, especially Caroline also from uh, Western RLC. And it just felt to me like 
they were coming together as like the <laughs> like the messiahs for the mental health system to uh, bring us the truth and bring us um, what we really needed to hear, what what what's been missing. And we've known that something was missing. And I'm just uh, so grateful. Um, so let's see. Um, I So lastly, before I um, introduce Cindy Marty, just to say that the first uh, Friends and Voices track was offered last February in Florida. And um, I felt so grateful to be a part of that so that, um, you know, we can help spread the word to other um, parts of the country, and they are starting in other parts of the country. Uh, Cindy Marty's been co-facilitating a support group for friends and family. It's It's been about a year. It's been like since last October. And um, so it's been very powerful for those seeking support beyond the medical model. I'll give a little bit more of my experience about after uh, after Cindy talks. Now, Cindy will tell us more about this unique, loving, compassionate, and paradigm-changing approach. Thank you, Pat. I'm going to uh, try to do a screen share. There you okay. go. All right. Yeah. So I'm Cindy Marty Hedge. Uh, I'm a voice here. I'm also a parent. Um, Personally, for me, the Hearing Voices Network changed my life. It uh, totally enabled me to have a life that uh, that I would want to live. And, you know, as a parent, I have five kids. And, and one of those kids struggles. And I want to talk about, uh, you know, for so long, um, both as a uh, growing up, I, I had a mother who was the identified patient and people would come in and all the attention would be focused on, you know, what was wrong with my mother and, and, and how do we fix that? And, you know, us kids were kind of left by the wayside and um, instead of taking a family approach and realizing that if there's one person in the house who's in a lot of distress, there's a lot of distress in the household. And so we thought about trying to create a family and friends group that was actually rooted in, in Hearing Voices Network values. And a little bit about the Hearing Voices Network movement is that the values incorporate a fundamental belief that there are many ways to understand hearing voices. Right from the beginning, from the, the time uh, Marius Rome, a uh, psychiatrist, was challenged by a woman he was working with, Pat Haga. It's been a partnership. It's been a partnership between people in professional roles and people with lived experience and with family members. And what was what has been difficult is that so many family members reach out looking for support and for you know a long time we we've talked about oh you can get active this way that way, but it wasn't really about how to support those family members. And this idea that, you know, hearing voices makes sense in relationship to personal life experiences. And, and the idea that the problem is not with hearing voices itself, but the difficulty in navigating the experience was a new concept for families and for voice hearers alike. So many uh, parents or family members, you know, would be told when they sought help for their loved one that um, the goal was to get rid of the voices and the method was heavy-duty psych drugs, and many of these parents tried very hard to, you know, take the expert advice, but for a lot of families, the expert advice seemed to go against, uh, you know, one's own heart, and actually even impaired the relationship that they had with their loved ones, so lots of people were looking for an alternative. Uh, you know, some people would say to me, you know, if, if the medication worked, great, but what I'm seeing in my uh, loved one is, you know, all sorts of physical issues, uh, cognitive issues, and, you know, I had one uh, person telling me it's almost like the drugs are are uh, sniffing out my child's soul. 
And a lot of the work that we're trying to do with an HVN is to try to create a more accepting society for people who hear voices. And, uh, you know, people love to throw around the word stigma, but, you know, I, I think it minimizes the impact because what's really happening is uh, discrimination and people losing their basic human rights. And so I'm kind of an anti-anti-stigma person and would rather really talk about you know, people's rights to make decisions and to um, their, their, you know, whether to get locked up or not locked up, to have medication forced on them or not, you know, to be able to parent their children, to have relationships. And, and the kind of the joke where I work is that it was much easier to clear my criminal record than my mental health record. And my mental health record continues, you know, to follow me. And uh, sometimes um, you know, I have a negative impact on, on my rights. Family and friends groups. Um, family and friends, of course, are uniquely positioned to validate the experience of those who hear voices or perceive other things, you know, not perceived by others. At the same time, you know, if you're a family member, and where do you have the space to say, this is how I feel? Can I talk about what's going on without feeling guilty for not focusing all my energy on my loved one? Can I really have a space to examine my own fears and my own understanding of uh, my loved one's experience? It's almost like, do we have permission to talk about what's going on for us when we're trying to support somebody in distress? And the hope of these family and friends groups is to create that space. To be able to uh, respect their loved one's experience, to examine their own feelings and beliefs as a gateway to changing the relationship to the loved one. So when uh, if I go to a family member and they tell me, you know, that's not real or you're being silly, you know, that's, that's damaging the relationship right there. But uh, to be able to instead say, you know, maybe I don't understand, but can you tell me more about it would be really helpful. Taking ownership of their fears and examining where the fears come from and how to manage them. And so often, I know I know for myself as a parent, uh, you know, I, 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 I was threatened, you know, make your son take this or you're a bad parent. You know, make your son take this or he's not getting out of this, uh, you know, this institution. And it was really, really difficult. You know, what other, what other medical procedure would a parent not have a right to say, no, I don't think that's good for my child. So it's, it's kind of amazing the amount of uh, power play going on there. Uh, we do a lot of sharing in the family and friends groups, you know, sharing what's been helpful, you know, what resources are available. And we explore you know, we explore language and how the language language impacts you know, how we interact. So a lot of times people throw around this word crisis. And if we examine what is the crisis, sometimes the crisis is the family members need to get sleep or, or they're afraid. And that the crisis doesn't actually lay within the person hearing voices. You know, the crisis may be I don't understand what's going on with them and I'm afraid. And so we'll look at that. You know, what is that fear? Uh, validating people's, you know, family and friend members' experiences while at the same time helping them to develop empathy to undo stereotypes and discrimination. Sometimes in these family groups, you know, family members will say, I don't understand why, you know, my loved one is doing this. And then someone else might share, well, maybe that's a strategy that works for a lot of people who hear voices. You know, putting it into that context of, can you imagine what it's like for the other person? And ultimately, the most important thing is to create a safe place for family members to talk about their experiences without judgment, ridicule, ridicule or unsolicited advice. Now, where can you talk about my my adult child is having a problem without somebody coming in and telling you, oh, what they think you should do or judging you for saying, oh, you know, 
why is your child, uh, you know, struggling? You know, what was their childhood like? And to instead say, you know, let's create a space where, you know, we, we know what we know. And if we learn more, maybe we can do better. And this is one of the, the big tools that we use in family and friends groups to talk about validating the person's experience, to talk about curiosity, just to ask and to be curious about what that loved one is going through and vulnerability to share, you know, how, how I'm doing in this moment. You know, what I want to be with you. And I want to listen to your stories. But right now I need you to do X, Y, or Z, and then I'll come back to it. Or I'm so sorry. You know, I wish I knew how to help, but I'm really not sure what to say in this moment. But I can be with you. I'm in this with you, you know, and, and will uh, support you to try to figure out a path that makes sense. Uh, community is huge. You know, Connecting, connecting sometimes uh, is heartbreaking. Sometimes as a parent, I am not the best person to support my child through something. And to be able to connect them with somebody who is in a better position, you know, this, this whole, uh, so many uh, people get into this place where, you know, it's, it's such a hard feeling when somebody says to me, but you're the only person I can talk to. And my response is, we need to get more people in. And part of this community piece, too, can be not just talking about the, the struggles or the hard times. The community piece can also be, where do you feel strong? Where do you feel good in the world? You know, what, what brings, uh, you know, what feeds your soul? And uh, Pat mentioned uh, Caroline, the, the training director for the Western Mass RLC. and if you have a chance to watch our uh, video, our movie that we showed at I ISBS last year, you know, uh, Beyond Possible, How the Hearing Voices Approach Transforms Lives. I mean, a piece of uh, Caroline's story is roller derby. That's what made her strong. And um, for me, what made me strong was hearing, um, was rejecting what I was told by the medical model. And what makes my child who struggle, struggles strong is knowing that he knows that I made it through and so that it might be possible for him to make it through as well. And um, I'm going to, uh, if you could stop the screen share and we can go back to Pat, that would be uh, awesome. time because it's um yeah sorry I think I was muted there I could listen to you talk for so long because it's so validating to you know what what my belief system is and it's like yeah that's right yeah that's right and um and I so seldom hear it out in the world but I'm so excited that uh more and more like at this conference and um People are waking up with everything that's happening and, and, and waking up in a lot of different ways, wanting to yeah. make changes. I was thinking, um, you know, I, I really love Shaku Matthias's uh, keynote because he talked about as long as we center all the issues in the individual, we're missing the boat. There's a cultural context. There's a social context for people's experiences. And the idea that, that if people are harmed in relationship, they can also be healed in relationship. You know, and, and to look at that, it's not so simple as to say, you know, it's just this one individual having an issue. It's a whole bunch of people in this world having various uh, barriers to meaning, purpose, and connection. And so how do we look at the bigger picture? Absolutely. And I like how you talk about choosing frameworks, that there's a lot of frameworks out there as a way of looking at people's struggles, people's difficulties. And um, 
you know, there are people that we know in the world that really value hearing voices as an experience um, as leaders in their community. And that's, um, they're chosen because people from the other side have given them the gift of communicating through them and they're sought out in their communities and valued. So it so much depends on, you know, the context, as you were saying, Cindy, and also the framework that we choose to see things in. Um, I feel really thankful these days that um, my son is doing really well. Um, in the last year, he had two hospitalizations, two residential treatment stays, one chemical dependency placement, and a crisis program. And while he's been working hard to meet the requirements of his commitments, um, I see him just like the parents when we talk in the support group as, you know, our loved ones are heroes for surviving and, and making it through. And I also see parents who go beyond the medical system because in some ways, I mean, I'll be the first to admit, you know, when my son was, you know, couldn't sleep and walking for hours and, you know, wasn't talking to me. Um, and for the hospital to say, oh, well, he's going to stay here now. It was kind of like, oh, a relief. I don't have to be up wondering where he is and what's going on. Um, so there is, and I totally get that. And, you know, if that works for people, for everybody, <laughs> then, you know, people choose that. Um, on the other hand, there are other ways of healing and looking at situations, um, you know, like while Marty, Cindy Marty was talking about VCVC, the validation, curiosity, vulnerability, and community. Um, I had a situation at the end of May with my son where he called me from one of his programs and was asking me if I could give him a ride to a new place. And, um, you know, he'd been dissatisfied there, and I knew that. And uh, this was George Floyd week, and I live in Minneapolis, so it was a little scary. The city was on fire, and I wasn't sure where he was um, wanting to go there. But for me, you know, previously, I would have just said, you know, um, what the heck are you talking about? It's scary out there, and you don't even know where this place is and what it's like and whatnot. And I was able to, after hearing the experiences of other parents over time in the support group, I was able to, you know, be vulnerable with them and ask, you know, where, where the place was so that I could see, you know, how to get there and whatnot. Um, I could show curiosity, you know, um, I'm sorry, that was uh, curiosity there. And uh, wondered if he, you know, had let his ACT team know, because they were always the ones that had found places for him. So for him to show this uh, motivation and initiative, I was just so, um, so amazed and so proud of him. Um, and it was important to validate those efforts because uh, that was important to him. And he was finding a place that he was going to feel better, or at least he was he thought he would feel better than the place that he was. Um, but it was a lot of fear. It was a lot of fear um, that I had at first, like, you know, what's going to happen? And, oh, you know, you want me to drive in this place that's, you know, we're having riots all over the place. And, and at the same time, you know, I had the experience of people talking through so many um, kind of horrific instances um, of their kids and being able to be in there with them and actually um, not abandon their kids and, you know, to have a connection. It's uh, so powerful. And, you know, it all worked out. It all worked out there. He was there for the weekend. And then on Monday, I drove him over to um, the, his new place that he was going to live. So being able to embrace my own vulnerability by admitting, you know, I didn't know what to do in the moment because there have been so many moments that I haven't known what to do, um, then we can work it out together because then we're in the moment. And so um, sharing my pain and sadness and grief with him is, uh, that's what int intimacy and connection is. 
Also, listening to his anger at times has been an important part of our healing. It can be painful, but I'm really grateful because that comes from somewhere. And that um, gives us the closeness. Uh, just last week, we were talking about he's getting an oral medication and I, or an injection. And I was saying, well, you know, yeah, let's talk to your team because it's so uncomfortable and he doesn't like it. And, um, you know, he was getting upset and he didn't want to talk to them about it because he doesn't like to bother people and wants to just keep the status quo and whatnot. And so he was getting upset. And uh, a few minutes later, I was in the other room and he comes in and he said, well, I'm, I'm sorry that I was getting angry about that. And I said, no, you have every right to be angry about that, that you're in this system and it's so big and it's so overpowering and it's so complicated and whatnot. So being able to validate him in his feelings is also really important. Uh, lastly, I think a valuable part of being in Cindy's support group is to be able to hear, um, uh, in particular, Cindy, who's a person with lived experience, share in ways that help us as parents make sense and have empathy for our loved ones. As many times Cindy has talked about situations where yeah, she knew, you know, what she wanted in that situation and people around her were, you know, resistant and whatnot, but she had a good reason for feeling the way that she did. And I find that very validating and being able to just see another perspective. Uh, yeah, Cindy, what else? Just to say that the gift of parenting is we keep getting new opportunities to do it differently. Right. And and this idea about that, um, you know, it took me a long time to learn that I'm not going to be able to offer support if I don't take care of myself. You know, and, and permission to actually uh, take care of myself, or to know what my limits are, or or and to, and or and to voice and own my own fears, to say them out loud. Um, I have this story about um, having my son in a kitchen, you know, and he's, uh, you know, you know, cutting the air with a knife and inside I am freaking out and I, I call somebody up and they said, why don't you ask him what he's doing? And they're like, is he yelling? I'm like, no. Is he threatening anybody? I'm like, no. And so I asked my son, you know, what are you doing? And he says, oh, I can hear the noise of the air getting cut by the knife. Can you hear it? And so I said, well, let's, you know, let me try. And um, then I can validate, yeah, that is an interesting sound. And now that you've done it for this long, can you stop now? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was uh, really, really good to... Uh, to you know own my fear breathe through it and have enough space to be curious about what was actually going on for the person to actually check in and sure we if people have questions i think that it would be wonderful but uh, to in the i just want to again say within the family and friends group it is this non-judgmental place where people can explore how do i create balance how do I take care of me and be available for, for my loved one? You know, what does a uh, mutual support look like? And how do I own my own experience in the midst of something? Yeah, if I could, uh, before we open up for questions, um, give one more example of, you know, in my uh, previous experiences, trying to figure out what to do as a parent. This was several years ago, and um, my daughter was living with me at the time, and my son was not, but he was, um, he had his apartment, but he was spending a lot of time at my house, and he was on the couch downstairs, and this was three o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden, I heard my daughter screaming, get out, and I wake up, and then I heard my son go downstairs, and my daughter is screaming, mom. Um, yeah, needless to say, I was very scared. I had no idea what was going on. 
Um, and I really didn't know what to do. And so I went and I talked to my daughter and she said, he just came barging in here. Her room, her door was locked and he just came through and, and she didn't know why and she didn't know what was going on. So I went downstairs and um, my son was laying on the couch and he wasn't saying a lot. He had not been feeling real well lately. And um, I had a hard decision to make. And as much as I wish I would have known then what I do now, um, I didn't, and I relied on calling 911, and I knew that they were going to come, and I knew that he was probably going to be taken for to ER, and there was a part of myself that felt so, so upset about, it was almost like feeling like I was reduced to that level, and at the same time, I didn't feel like I had a lot of other alternatives. Um, well, as it goes, so down the road, um, we were talking a few months, you know, later and he was, um, out of the hospital and, and, and I just feel really grateful that we are able to stay in touch and whatnot. Um, and we were talking about, you know, what had been happening. And I asked him, I said, you know, I, you know, you went up into Leah's room and were you wanting to talk to her about something? And he said, no, I started having these fears that uh, there were people up in her room. I thought I heard these guys talking up there. So I was going up there to see what was happening and he wanted to be helpful. So he was actually going up there out of love and compassion in his heart that something might have been happening to her. And I just think about if you know, being able to just understand that, that I don't always know what is going on within people. And as Cindy was saying to, you know, acknowledge my fear and know that I always have choices, which thank goodness I know more now. Um, yeah. Did you have any final min anything to, uh, to add Cindy before we open to questions or? Well, I just love your story because uh, we're, we're so trained by the medical model and um, public misconception to be coming from a place of fear. And uh, can you imagine being in a relationship with people who are afraid of what you're going to do? Like it just increases stress. And, um, and, you know, you know, I, I kind of joke, you know, when, when, uh, when I've been in the hospital and they've had somebody, you know, what I was, you know, we, you know, I would say it's unfair to call me paranoid when people are staring at me. Like, that's just not fair, you know? And, um, and it's a totally different thing to say, I'm going to be in relationship and I'm going to hold up hope and possibility. And I'm going to uh, remind people in this world who my beautiful child is. And my child is, you know, has had a life before this diagnosis and deserves a life after this diagnosis. And that's what I'm going to raise up. But it is hard because people come at you with all the uh, fear and not so much the possibility. And so within HVM, part of these groups is people sharing successes, mm -hmm. sharing how their relationships have changed with their loved one, you know, how they've learned to actually support them as a team in a partnership versus doing all these fear-based things and also to be transparent about whatever our limits are you know what you know i can tolerate this but this thing up over here just freaks me out too much i'm too afraid so to own that and and, and, and to put that out there so i i love your story it really illustrates the point is if we if you can breathe through that fear long enough to have some curiosity, we might have really different outcomes. And that um, it's so wonderful when I'm, you know, when things are going well, like they really are at our, at our house. Um, my son comes over to help bake bread and he helps me do this juicing that I need to do to stay healthy. He goes on errands for me. He's, he's compassionate. He's um, empathic. I just had the, 
uh, sewer back up a couple of days ago and he yesterday came over and brought all the rugs to the laundromat to, um, you know, clean them up and whatnot. And I just, I feel so grateful. I mean, he was a snowboarder, snowboarding in Colorado before he, you know, had all these issues and problems and, you know, skateboarding. And I know, you know, to be able to empathize with that he misses that. And because of the drugs that he's on, it makes it really difficult for him to be, you know, balancing physically and whatnot. Um, and I encourage him and see him as having a lot of other gifts. Like he put together my gas grill and he'd never even grilled before. And, and I think um, the powerful part of hearing other parents talk about ways that they found to honor their kids and see the things that are going well and the parts that um, are, you know, gifts to people around. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's okay. We had a, um, a conference last spring. It was an international conference. I can't remember if you were on there, Cindy, or not. Um, and people talked about, how, and it was providers, and it was people with lived experience, family members, everybody. And the providers were talking about how they are really learning from people with lived experience about how to survive when it's uh, being in fear and not knowing what's going to happen and feeling alienated and just all the things that all the COVID stuff has created um, around the world, actually. And, um, you know, it's, it's the rest of us getting a taste for what that might feel like and to experience uh, day to day. So I just loved how, you know, now it's our turn to learn from those with the experience that have um, gained so many skills and how to survive in that kind of an environment for years and years and years. Yes, yeah, yeah. How isolating, how isolating uh, having extreme ex experiences. Guys, um, you know, you, you can lose friends, families. It can change the entire possibility of having a conversation once somebody is seen as a mental patient. And, you know, a meaning, purpose, and connection. I believe it's important to everybody. And so it is kind of amazing with COVID that lots of people have now had the uh, experience of feeling isolated or not able to work the way they used to work. And so maybe it does develop more empathy. Maybe it does. Yeah. 